Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. I'm one of my writers, Angus, this time. Hello, Angus. Thank you for writing this. Mikhail Popkov, the werewolf in sheep's clothing. Alternative, the Engance Mania. Oh, I see. He's given me many, many title options. I probably already picked one. I think I did. Um, but I don't remember which one it was. Anyway, this is about Mikhail Popkov. He's a bad dude who killed a lot of people. Apparently, judging from these titles that Angus has given me. The format of the show, if you're new, is that uh, I've never read this before. We're going to explore it together. Settle in, um, make a cup of tea, do whatever you do, because this is 35 pages long, which is extremely long. I don't know how many hours this ends up being, but it's probably at least a couple, right? An hour and a half? Two hours? Two and a bit? I really can't guess. Anyway, let's just jump into it, because we've got a long journey ahead of us. In the far east of Russia, on the Yakutsk Oblast, lies a small city called Angarsk. Built in the 1940s, it's another one of those wondrous planned Soviet cities. The kind of city that serves as more of a monument to the gulag system than any political doctrine. During the winters, temperatures get as low as minus 27 Celsius. And in the summer, it crests 25 degrees. I wish you'd given us those in Fahrenheit, Angus, because... I don't care about it, but I'm sure the Americans listening do. Hey Siri, what's minus 27 Celsius in Fahrenheit? So minus 16 Fahrenheit and hey Siri, what's 25 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? Siri's just, I know you guys can't hear it, but Siri's just completely mishearing me and telling me that it's like 400 degrees. I don't suffocate me, man. Look, 25 degrees Celsius is a little warmer than you might set your air conditioning. Reversing the clocks to 1997 and you would see a city housing some 200,000 people. And one of those people was a five-year-old girl called Natasha Gorolina. Earlier that year, Natasha had fallen ill and been transported to a hospital for preschoolers on the outskirts of the city. Every week, parents were allowed to come and visit their children, and every week, Natasha's mother, Tatiana, would come to visit her. The family was no longer around, and Tatiana was trying to provide for her daughter on her own. Though she couldn't give a lot, she could still bring snacks on the days that she visited, and then one day, without explanation, her mother wasn't there anymore, and several days later, Natasha got sent home. She recalls that when she got home, there was a lot of very sad people all standing around her grandmother's living room. Then a family member took her aside and told her that her mother had gone away and wouldn't be coming back. It's often difficult to remember that the victims of a serial killer are not just the ones that they kill. From then on, Natasha would have to grow up without a mother. On the day of her death, Tatiana had gone to the market, bought some clothes and some alcohol, and went drinking with a friend. The main reason why Natasha had never known her father was that her mother lived what she called a free lifestyle. On the night of her death, June the 17th, 1997, Tatiana Gorolina was partying with her friends, and by 1 a.m., her friends were ready to call it a night. Unfortunately, Tatiana wasn't, and she got a taxi home with her cousin, went inside, got changed into some white high heels, and then returned to the night. She would not be seen again for two days. She was found lying by the side of the road in a forest several miles out of town. The attacker had sexually assaulted her and then killed her by swinging a hammer into her face. The family would identify Tatiana by those same white high heels. Now, the title of this episode is 83 Victims and Counting, which depresses me. In fact, maybe they haven't caught the person who's been murdering all these, uh, well, so far one woman, but obviously it's going to be many more. I remember we did an episode oh, it's many months ago now. It was also set in Russia, and it was also about a serial killer who went, like, I couldn't believe how long I, and i know like there's lots of episodes where a serial killer doesn't get caught for ages but the two we've done from russia so far and it's taken them ages to get caught when the police searched tatiana's home they found a notebook with the names of 70 or so men in it along with locations times and dates some men had multiple dates others had only one it was clear that tatiana's free lifestyle included regular relations with strangers the autopsy showed that the only drug in her system was alcohol and not in high enough levels to cause her to black out there were no signs of a fight or restraints around her wrists other than the wounds on her face the only other marks found on her were strangulation marks around her neck from all of this, investigators surmise that she hadn't been brought to that forest against her will. She had gotten into someone's car and willingly gone with them to the forest to have sex. This was confirmed by a family who said that she made a habit of getting into cars with strangers. There were no witnesses, no murder weapon was found, and no other clues were detected. Though the police didn't say it to the family, it was their feeling that this was an isolated incident. Whoever had done it was an opportunist. The chance to commit the perfect crime had fallen into his lap and he had taken it. It was unlikely that such rare circumstances would fall into their lap again, and with little hope of finding the culprit, they shelved the evidence, logged the incident, and moved on 
How about you do a little bit more than that when a woman's been murdered with a hammer in her face after being raped in the forest, police? How about you do a little bit more than that and get your shit together? And also, I don't really feel that this is something that is unlikely to happen again. If someone gets away with a crime, the odds are they're going to commit that crime again because they're like, oh, look, I got away with it. And apparently, he's going to get away with it a lot more times, which is, again, police, do your job. And Garsk was not a peaceful city. It was no stranger to dead bodies. Oh, when it was built back in the 1940s, the city was intended to be the hub of uranium refinement for the USSR, and that still is the city's primary economy, that and petrochemicals. When the gulags opened and the prisoners were released, many had no families left, so they returned to the city that they'd built. It was this high proportion of prison convicts and the chronic underfunding of police services that led to an unusually high crime rate in the city. To a police officer, barely a day would go by without at least one report of a dead body coming in over the radio. So finding the body of a woman who spent her evenings propositioning strangers in cars wasn't going to make the top of the priority list. As one officer put it, what did she expect going out like that? She was asking for trouble. Now granted, I'm quoting one particularly nasty officer, but you get the gist. Yeah, sadly I do. And if you've got a city filled with crime, obviously the police have limited resources. I just feel that murder should be quite high up their list. And uh, I know it's like, it was just pretty solid victim blaming there. To put it another way, it would be hard to find a city better suited for a serial killer to ply their trade. With a police force still equipped to even deal with a pub brawl, it would make avoiding detection that bit easier. The death of Tatiana Gorolina serves as an example of just how ill-equipped this police force was to deal with the protagonist of today's episode, a cold-blooded killer that ranks as possibly the most competent serial killer that we've yet covered on this channel, and possibly the most prolific serial killer in Russian history. But if the police is does that make you a good serial killer? If you were, like, killing people in a country with super competent police, you'd, you'd probably get caught sooner. So does it make you better? No, it just makes them worse. Although apparently, I'm going to guess because they managed to kill so many people that they're quite a good serial killer anyway. And have they been caught? The title really implies that they haven't been caught, which is the worst kind of ending because they're still out there. It's like Pedro Lopez. Oh boy, here we go again. We return to Pedro Lopez yet again, where it was like the worst thing about that episode. I mean, obviously, no, the worst thing was all the children he killed. Um, but the fact that he's still out there just was never brought to justice, which is just insane. I'm sorry I sound very nasally today. I can hear it in my own voice. I have a cold, if you couldn't tell. And all of the coughing and spluttering, I'm sure, is cut out. <laughs> just like this. But, uh, yeah, feeling a bit rough today. <laughs> Now let me interrupt today's video to tell you about today's fantastic video sponsor, Enlisted, which is a new kind of first-person shooter that uniquely couples PvP with PvE combat. Take command of a squad of customizable AI soldiers and fight in massive battles with hundreds of targets led by other players. Enlisted offers multiple campaigns to play through featuring their own unique weapons, vehicles, and equipment from the outskirts of Moscow in 1941 to the heart of Berlin in 1945. So a good bit of, you know, historical accuracy for the battles there. Play on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, or the previous console generation. Enlisted has tons of great stuff. They've got over a hundred weapons, tanks, and aircraft from famous tanks like the M4 Sherman, which, uh, by the way, I've got a channel called Mega Projects where we cover all sorts of weapons like that. And also obscure little guns like the VG2. Enlisted offers a massive arsenal of weapons to unlock. Also, there's incredible graphics and detail. Look, you know, games look pretty amazing these days, and Enlisted is absolutely one of them. Plus, the sound is pretty epic, which uh, just adds the whole immersion of the game. Obviously, a huge amount of time is put into weapons, vehicles, environments, and effects. And good news, it even looks pretty good on lower end machines, so you don't need some gaming beast to be able to run Enlisted. Now, I mentioned it earlier what I like about Enlisted is, well, one thing, it's quite easy to jump in and just get playing with the game immediately, and you don't like, have to be an expert or anything. So play Enlisted for free on PC, Xbox Series X or S and PS5 and enlisted.link forward slash enlisted casual criminalist, or because that's a bit of a nightmare, there is a link below, and now back to today's video. The Werewolf of Angarsk. So yes, the topic of the video is Russia's most prolific serial killer. However, for whatever reason, the macabre interest that draws all the true crime enthusiasts to such a topic like this doesn't seem to have translated to the English-speaking world. As such, there really isn't that much information about this case available to English speakers. Fortunately for you, dear viewer and or listener, I have a passable understanding of the Russian language, as well as a very helpful friend. What? Angus, you have a... How long have you been an agent for the KGB? 
unless I'm mistaken, Ang- Angus, just as far as I, is just a dude in the UK who apparently has a possible understanding of the Russian language. Super impressed. I was talking with my my wife, and she was saying like, because we she's Czech, I'm British, and our kids uh, we raised to speak both languages. And she's like, in the UK, are people impressed if? because we were we were on holiday and someone was saying like because our kid you know mixes the languages now and doesn't really speak english or czech properly we were on holiday and someone was like telling their kids like because they didn't really understand our kid it's like oh she speaks two languages they were british so she's very clever and i'm like yeah yeah, yeah british i've totally forgot that british people think this that if you speak two languages they're like wow because no one speaks two languages um how do we get here that's why i'm so impressed at angus's ability to understand russian because it's just super rare for british people <laughs> We don't speak other languages, we speak English! The best language! The legacy of colonialism. And as such, I've compiled what I believe to be the most comprehensive compendium of this man's crimes that can be found anywhere on the English-speaking internet at 35 pages, Angus. You bloody well have. It's also worth mentioning that for some reason, details on precisely who the victims were are incredibly sparse. Many articles just skate over the victims, and still others will make stuff up altogether. I did my best to gather an accurate timeline and use only verifiable details and sources on the victims that we know about because I think it's important that they're remembered. But even so, there are large chunks of the timeline that are just unaccounted for. I've tried to contact the relevant authorities, but it seems that most Russian investigators aren't in the mood to talk with an English researcher who emails them at four o'clock in the morning. That's weird. But as far as we know, the killings began on a cold January morning in 1992. A woman known only as Ms. Dorogova had just left her apartment and is on the way to the train station to pick up her mother. The time was just before 5 a.m. and the sun wasn't far off rising. As she makes her way down the street, a car pulls over in front of her. As she approaches, the window rolls down and the driver offers her a lift, which she gratefully accepts. He asks where she's going, and she says to the train station. While they drive, he starts up a conversation, asking about what she does for a living and if she's married. Just as a general rule, bring it up again, don't, especially especially women, don't get in cars with strangers. Just don't do it. Just, I know it's cold and it's 5 a.m. Just walk. It's better to walk. Don't get in the car. Please. Although it starts lightheartedly enough, the conversation begins getting heated and they begin arguing. By that point, they were nearly at the train station, but unfortunately, she was never going to make it. In a moment of blind fury, the driver grabs a bottle of sparkling wine and cracks it over her head. The driver begins panicking and pulls over at an abandoned train terminal. He pulls the victim out of the car, into the abandoned building, and proceeds to rape her. What? <laughs> it's like, oh no, I thought he was panicking because he killed her. And then he's like, oh no, I've killed someone, what am I going to do? Oh god, I've got to get rid of a body or go to the police or something. And it's like, no, 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 I've got to find someone to rape her. What, a rape her body, what the f***? Once he's done, he puts his hands around her neck and squeezes her until he no longer feels a pulse. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, so she was still alive. So we haven't quite cracked necrophilia yet, but why do I get the feeling we're going to get there? Only 500 meters away, her mother is waiting at the train station for her daughter to arrive, and the driver flees the scene, leaving no useful evidence. The following year, on August the 28th, the police receive a call that a body has been found in some bushes by the side of the road, in the suburbs of Angarsk. Upon their arrival, they find the charred corpse of Tamara Sheveliva, and again, there was no evidence that could be pulled from the scene. The police ruled it a killing related to the gangs operating in the city, and put no more effort into investigating the matter. Yeah, of course, why would you? Gangs aren't important criminal enterprises to deal with as a police force. There's much more important things to be doing, like tea, donuts, coffee. If Simon hasn't already pointed it out, there isn't a whole lot to connect this killing and the 1992 killing. No, indeed, there's no, I didn't point it out, but like different MO, different location, different uh, body in a different condition afterwards. We don't know if there's any sexual assault, which makes it excusable that the police didn't connect the two. Not so much with the next murder, though. Almost exactly one year later to the day, on the 30th of August 1994, the body of 15 year old Irina Shodorova was discovered lying in a forest next to a dirt road that itself connected to the city bypass. She'd gone missing 16 days prior when she left school. The cause of death wasn't clear, but she too had been set on fire. What little information they could pull from the body suggested that the burning was not the cause of death, though, meaning she had been burned post-mortem simply as a means to hide the evidence. Two bodies left by the side of the road, both were known to enjoy partying, both had been burned to hide evidence. Now, that is something the police definitely need to connect, guys. Like, two burned bodies of the same demo victim come on the best thing that could be said is that investigators didn't just brush it off as a gangland killing and accepted that this must have been done by a person or persons operating independently even so they didn't connect this killing and the killing from the previous year i mean another reason might be that there's just so many killings 
This was basically a town that uh, a large proportion of the population were previously at a gulag. And I know a lot of the people, wasn't it? It was roughly a third were actual criminals, a third were political, and a third were like... Um, a prisoners of war or something isn't that wasn't that the rough breakdown of the gulag something like that so either way there's going to be plenty of criminals who called this town home so maybe there was just a lot of murder and potentially other burned bodies i mean it seems unlikely tie it together guys come on that also doesn't mean that they knew they had a serial killer on the loose it just means that they knew someone in the city was willing to kill for some other reason than gang violence then in 1995 we can start to see a dramatic increase in the frequency of bodies turning up that summer the bodies of two young women were found in a forest clearing several kilometers from the 1994 site the only other thing i could find out for certain was that they'd been missing for months there was no information on their names or their age then there is about a year that is unaccounted for and seems to be entirely unreported for whatever reason and in spite of my best efforts i can't seem to find a single source giving direct information about the killer's activity in the year 1996. there is vague referential information saying that he killed between two and three dozen people between the years 1996 and 1998 but i can't find anything more than that yeah vague referential information is like this is where the false facts come out as i've said it before many times like someone will write something or misinterpret a fact or get a translation wrong or read something from an an old book or something that's just not been properly fact checked they'll post it on one website and then other websites will pick it up and spread it around the internet and then you're like oh yeah but it's on three different websites so it must be true even though they don't cite their sources and yeah if there's no primary evidence or solid secondary evidence then i don't think you can make any assumptions like he killed between two and three dozen people how according to who why what do we know what i do know for sure is that every murder during this period followed a similar mo to the one that i just recounted to you a woman is last seen either going home or going out at some time near dark then they're found at the side of the road uh, they were almost always choked unconscious and then attacked with a weapon and each attack saw a different weapon used the next credible account that i was able to find was the one that i opened on with the death of tatiana Gorolina. if the police chose to investigate a murder then that is a big if they would usually find evidence that the woman was considered to be of ill repute that is to say the killer seemed to have a knack for picking up only women who would be okay with getting in a stranger's car and then driving with them to a secluded area of the woods most likely to have sex this was quite often a prostitute but not exclusively now during this time not one member of the police force ever shared a suspicion that these murders may have been the work of a single individual this is likely because the murderer's choice of victim often left the police unwilling to commit significant resources to find these quote unquote immoral women also he's using a different weapon every time which is definitely something that's going to throw them off because it's a different mo even if there's other things that are similar they'll be like why is he using a different weapon or to quote the officer from the intro with that kind of behavior what did she expect to happen in fact it wasn't until 1997 that we start to see a sneaking suspicion among police officers there might be a serial killer operating in angask why on earth oh would they possibly think that i don't know maybe it's because of all the serial killing that's going on perhaps cops come on come on do your job while the police dithered about whether or not they should start investigating the multiple homicides occurring within their city another body turned up this time it was oksana stroganova who on the 14th of september 1997 went out to buy food for her family on the way back she dropped in on a friend and decided to have a drink several drinks later oksana decided it was time to go home and began hitchhiking her way back and that was how she met the killer of angask her body was found several days later in a forest clearing she had been stabbed multiple times with a screwdriver 1998 it's now been six years since the first murder took place there are supposedly dozens of bodies to this killer's name and the police are only now growing suspicious that something just might be amiss get your together dozens guys dozens no matter how underfunded you are not accepting or noticing that there's a serial killer on the loose when the evidence is so blindingly obvious that my decrepit dog could spot it is negligence of biblical proportions yeah one victim no two victims mm, probably not three victims mm, four victims start looking into it you sh you should already be on that and this isn't just a negligent prosecutor or police chief that won't accept the facts we're talking negligence on every level of the organization following the murder of oksana stroganova the police searched the area around her body and found tire tracks that could only be from one very particular type of car a police car 
The area had been cordoned off, and so it wasn't from any of the investigators. It was almost certainly from the murderer. Now, there is, of course, some doubt to that claim. The car may have driven through a day before the murder, but even so, it would be foolish not to follow up on a lead like that. I think we can all guess what the police did with that evidence. They did absolutely f all. That's insane. You've just, you've got a serial killer on your loose who's killed dozens of people, and you have ignored, until now, some fairly solid lead to go on, which is investigate your f***ing other police officers, and you're ignoring your only pretty solid lead. It seemed that the killer wasn't above making mistakes, but I'll be damned if the police were about to hold that against him. And things were only about to get worse for the women of Angarsk. 1998 would prove to be his most prolific year yet. That year, it kicked off with no fewer than 13 women turning up on the same one-kilometer dirt track over a six-month period. How the f*** is that possible? These police barely exist, and if this crime is going on, you could bet this city is like some Gotham shithole. That is mental. And if you think that should make them suspicious, just wait till you hear what happens on the 18th of January when Yevgenia Protasova turns up in Angarsk Hospital. If I've learned anything from this show, it's that there are some people in this world that are just built different to the rest of us. It's my opinion that this girl, Yevgenia Protasova, is absolutely one of those badass people. On 18th of January, Evgenia was at a friend's house having a small party. As the night drew to a close, her friends offered to let her stay, but she insisted on going home and headed outside to find a taxi. As she stood on the curb, waiting, a man pulled in his car and asked if she needed a lift. What's your name? she asked. Mikhail, he responded. At first, she was apprehensive, but he pulled out a badge and showed it to her, reassuring her that he was a police officer. Take a bloody good look at that badge. Said this before on Casual Criminal. Someone comes to your door, if they're a police officer, the gas man, whatever, and you're... Even if you're not unsure, be like, can I see your ID? Dude, he's the killer. Just want to see your ID. I need to see some ID. Like, because anyone can buy a jacket of eBay, but, like, a proper legit ID? Yeah, yeah, you need to check on that. Don't be afraid to ask. No one minds. They don't mind. They'll just be like, oh, okay, good for you for being diligent. Mollified, she agrees to get into his car. Oh, but also, I'm sorry, he could be he's a real cop, isn't he? Oh my god. That's what I'm saying. As her friends come down to say goodbye, they see a black Honda Civic pulling away from the curb. During that journey, Mikhail questions her about why she was out at that time. She explains she was drinking with friends. He asks if she would like to continue the party. She says no, and the conversation ends there. As they drive home, she makes the mistake of falling asleep. When she wakes again, the car is pulling off the freeway and into a secluded wooded area. Immediately, she knows something is wrong, and it seems that Mikhail hasn't noticed that she's awake yet. Surreptitiously, she begins taking her high heels off, waiting for the car to come to a stop. As soon as they stop, she bolts, opening the door and sprinting as fast as she can. Unfortunately, she's still quite inebriated, and the only source of light is the car's headlights, which she has just left behind. In her haste, she runs into a tree and knocks herself out. Oh my god, that is so unfortunate. The next thing she remembers seeing is Mikhail standing over her, beating her with a branch before falling to his knees and strangling her. For literally dozens of women before Yevgenia, that had been the final thing they ever saw. This man standing over them, and similar to those women at some point during the attack, she lost consciousness, which for all reasonable people, would have been the end of the story. But Yevgenia, it seems, was not a reasonable person. Many hours later, she regained consciousness once again, completely naked, lying next to a dirt path in that same forest, with the sun just beginning to rise. There was no sign of her attacker, who had already left. When she tried to move, she found that she was physically unable to, and it wasn't long after that that she lost consciousness again, continuing to lie there for several more hours, completely naked, in the Siberian wilderness, in the middle of January. The next time she regained consciousness, she was lying in the hospital. A retired couple who were out for a walk had found her and called an ambulance. Upon arrival at the hospital, it was questionable whether she was going to survive. Her body was in an advanced state of hypothermia, and she was suffering from massive brain hemorrhage. She had spent the better part of a day receiving emergency surgery and then intensive care for the head trauma. But by some miracle, she managed to survive the whole ordeal, and uh, what was more, she could remember details of her attack. So. I think we can all agree total badass yeah totally agree and also what i'm depressed about already is that assuming this guy hasn't been caught because it's 83 and counting is the bloody title or whatever it's like how how what extraordinary levels of police incompetence are we headed into this was the first time someone had managed to survive an attack by this man. Not only that, she could remember his first name, his profession, and even the kind of car he drove. The testimony was a slam dunk and should have brought an end to the killings within a year, or at least confirmed that there was a serial killer on the loose. Right? Well, no. 
not even slightly she was after all drunk when it happened and moreover she had suffered head trauma in light of those facts the police felt her testimony wasn't reliable enough to afford any sort of investigation they also really super duper promised that it had nothing to do with the fact that she was accusing a police officer of rape and attempted murder there are systems in place for this right so that if it's a police officer suspected of something like they have that what's the guys in the movies internal affairs is moving where they're the, like the police the people who police the police like the military police or whatever internal affairs there's got to be someone like inside making sure the police like who polices the police it's internal affairs right it's internal affairs something like that i think that is that from brooklyn 99 the incompetence of the police here is beyond reckoning in fact i'd go so far as to say it's beyond incompetence yeah it is gross negligence even straying into corruption and cover-up territory yeah sorry gross negligence implies it's just negligence i think they're like they know something's up and they're intentionally burying it which is just corruption criminal level corruption the only follow-up the police did on her story was to interview the officer in question one mikhail popkov he of course denied any wrongdoing and said that he was at home with his family and his wife confirmed the alibi if you'll believe it the police accepted this and ruled him out as a suspect from then on wait but then we know his name right so is he just suspected of this or is he actually guilty i can't believe like i've read the title his name's in the bloody title and i'm still like well we don't know who it is but apparently we do but then how is it and counting oh my god maybe he does get caught that would be awesome but don't worry the police weren't done being useless because at some point in the latter part of the year it's unclear exactly when another witness turns up at the angarsk hospital svetlana nisivacheva I wasn't able to get her story in as much detail as Evgenia Protosova's, but we know that she was so near death when she arrived at the hospital that she was sent to the morgue, but she awoke shortly after arriving. The story she had to tell was much the same as Evgenia. Again, details are sparse on this one, but it seems that she accused a police officer without using Popkov's name. Her testimony was also ruled unreliable owing to head trauma. At this point, I'm thinking that working in the Angarsk police station would be like working in a Benny Hill sketch. I don't think working in the Angarsk police station would be something that's done. It seems like no work takes place there. They just kind of bum around and do nothing because they're f***ing useless pieces of shit, allegedly. However, we're finally getting to a point where so many bodies have turned up and all with identical circumstances of death that the police could no longer deny that there was maybe something suspicious going on. No, they weren't yet accepting there was a serial killer, they just thought something suspicious was going on. My good God. But who can blame them? The evidence rooms in the Angas police station were a literal shit show. As we have seen, murder cases were rarely investigated, and if they were, it was always a slapdash job, which meant that the investigations that were carried out would rarely be done well enough to bring in enough evidence to warrant a conviction. And that was before the evidence even made it into the evidence lockers. What little evidence they did have would often be mislabeled, missing, or entirely undocumented. As in, they had random objects in the locker that had been put there with no documentation to say it was evidence or the case that it was connected to, and there were even cases of evidence that was fully documented but was nowhere to be found in the evidence room. And to top it all off, the evidence room flooded on multiple occasions, destroying the few bits of usable evidence that remained. <laughs> Who is like running the police in Russia or in Siberia? Welcome everybody. Because it's like, is no one teaching you how to do this? It feels like you just got some like random dudes off the street. Well, I put on these police uniforms. You'll figure it out. Because no one knows what's going on. No one seems to have any training whatsoever or any degree of even remote confidence. Uh, competence, sorry. It's a trip. You know, it's like a serious vacation. According to the police, this evidence locker was one of the many reasons they struggled to make the connection between the killings for so many years. Let me just see if I'm understanding this correctly. They had a messy evidence locker, and the result was the inability to notice dozens of homicides occurring in the same area. I mean, who among us hasn't left their room a bit of a mess and then subsequently forgotten how to carry out the most basic functions of their job? It's a wonder they even noticed that people were dying at all. However, something had to click eventually, and it took the actions of someone higher up the chain to get the wheels of justice moving. 
For that to happen, the head justice of the Akursk region had to be the one to accept that there was a serial killer on the loose. As 1998 began to draw to a close, head justice Merzliakov wrote a letter to the lead prosecutor in the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Moscow. In this letter, he explained the situation and asked for consultory help. This would be the allocation of special investigators to direct and assist the Angarsk police force. They would be directly involved with the case, but they would advise remotely. It was at their recommendation that the information was made public that there was a serial killer operating in Angarsk. As the public had already figured this out several years ago, there was less of a cry of fear and more a collective sigh of exasperation. The police assembled all of the usable evidence on the case, which was comparatively minuscule oh, when you consider the body count so far. Again, just a reminder, the body count is in the dozens. A psychologist was consulted to assemble a profile of the killer, which was circulated around the police station. One of these made it onto the desk of one Mikhail Popkov, and it read as follows. Killer is likely of European descent, has or had a position in government, has a constant source of income, a good knowledge of Angarsk, possibly divorced, very disappointed in wife, likely due to an affair, is a prolific misogynist, and behaves very confidently. Can you be more specific? Certainly not. As you can probably tell, most of that profile sounds like it was copied from a file titled Generic Angarsk Citizen Number 52, with only a couple of accurate and specific details contained within, which we are going to cover in a moment. That's all they have? There was a woman who was in the car with him. That's the, 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 the come on. We got more from her than we got from this. What's the point of this person? It was also recommended by the task force that a good approach would be to use a newfangled technology called DNA sequencing. As nearly all the victims engaged in sex with or were raped by the killer, they were able to gather three solid DNA samples, and when you consider the state of their evidence system, it's honestly surprising that they had that many. The first conviction to ever involve DNA profiling had taken place in 1998, nearly a decade prior, so it wasn't an unproven technology, but it was also light years from where it is today. They had the funds to sequence the DNA, and it showed three matches, definitely proving that they were dealing with a serial murderer. But because the cost of DNA sequencing was still in the tens of thousands of dollars for a single sample, they couldn't go around sampling the whole of Angarsk, and so they couldn't go any further with this information. It is wild that something like in the 90s cost tens of thousands of dollars to sequence your DNA, and now it's like you could get it done for like 80 bucks with like Ancestry. This <laughs> is wild. Mikhail Popkov If you haven't already guessed it, the guy who was named by the attempted murder victim might have something to do with the murders after all. So let's take a moment to get to know him, shall we? How about we take a moment in the 1990s and let's spend 10 grand sequencing his DNA. And let's see if it matches. And if it does, let's hang him. Yeah? Mikhail Viktorovich Popkov was born on the 7th of March 1964 in the city of Norilsk. As best I can tell, his parents were not particularly abusive, but there does seem to be an aspect of negligence and apathy in their style of parenting. The first example of this kind of apathy was when, at the age of three, his parents moved from their home in Norilsk to Angarsk, leaving him with his grandparents. He wouldn't see his parents again for another three years. That's intense, in which time they'd had a daughter. Based on the fact that they were living in the days of the USSR, and housing was provided to families based on their size, it would not have been a matter of lacking funds that they left their child with his grandparents. Add to that the fact they had another child while he was away, and it does begin to appear that his parents may have harbored a certain amount of dislike toward their son. That's so weird. I can't imagine, like, not liking my kids. I mean, maybe when they get older and they turn out to be dicks or something, then you'd be like, oh, I don't really like you. Can you feel that way? Even saying that, if, even if they are dicks, I'm still going to like them. I don't know, they're so nice. It'd be so weird. Well, he was like five. Age of three, he wasn't even five. My kid's three. The idea that I couldn't like them is insane. They're three. They're just sweet. I mean, sure, they cry and they get upset and they're aggressive and all of this stuff. But they're three. How could you do this? How could you feel this way? He's a bad kid. It was not revealed to him that Popkov even had a little sister until he had moved back in with his parents. Quite reasonably so, the young boy felt rather abandoned and overlooked by his parents. And as he got older, this perception was reinforced by his parents' clear preference for their daughter. It's particularly notable that his mother was cold towards him, seemingly bestowing all of her maternal love upon her daughter. That's f***ed up. Like, I make a joke that I prefer my, my daughter to my son to my wife. I'm always like, yeah, 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 but because I prefer daughter 
And my wife's like, you got to stop saying that. They're going to be able to understand. And so now I have to stop saying it because they'll be under- able to understand. And I love them both equally, except for the daughter who I love more. <laughs> <laughs> that just kidding as he continued to grow up mikhail tried to win the affection of his parents back by focusing on his schoolwork and achieving good grades this was not effective and he continued to be overlooked but it did bring one very important facet of his personality to light and that was his phenomenal memory so good in fact that he would later be diagnosed with an eidetic memory also known as a photographic memory at the age of perhaps 12 or 13, Mikhail was sent to summer camp. This was a standard in those days of the Soviet Union. It was kind of like the Boy Scouts, with supplementary military education added into their day-to-day -day activities. Much like the young girl with whom we started our story, parents had allocated visitation days, which most parents would attend and bring treats for their kids. However, unlike the girl from the start of our story, Mikhail's parents made no effort to visit him. After several weeks of missing them, Mikhail ran away from the camp and returned home. When he got there, he found out that his parents had their own dirty little secret. It seems his mother was an exhibitionist and his father was a cuck. Oh my god, can you imagine walking in on that? <laughs> Be like, Mom, Dad, ah, what's going on? Guys, that's gross. If you have any questions of what those things are or how they interact in a marriage, just imagine the scene of a married woman and a man that is not her husband engaging in some demonetizable activities while the husband sits in the corner, watches, and optionally partakes in his own solo demonetizable activity. I don't think we needed that laid out for us, Angus, but thank you anyway. This was exactly the scene that met young Mikhail when he entered the family kitchen that summer day. That is some scarring on this guy's. And he's like, Mom, Dad, you know I have an eidetic memory. Why would you do this to me? You know I could never forget this. Why? Mommy and Daddy are getting it on. After witnessing his parents, and I'm not like kink shaming, but it would be super disturbing to walk in on your parents in that kind of situation. You know, uh, <laughs> uh. After witnessing his parents firsthand partaking in their unsavory drunken hobby, he was understandably rather distressed. This event is often pointed to as one of the more formative moments of his young life, but I'd argue that walking in on your parents, while very distressing, isn't so traumatic that it would drive you to serial killing. No, no, definitely not. It's weird and traumatic, but it's not like... And now I'm a serial killer. I don't think so. We'd likely have a lot more serial killers kicking about if that were the case. Personally, I'd argue that the prolonged parental apathy he contended with was far more damaging. But what do I know? I'm not a psychologist. No, Angus, I also think you're absolutely bang on. After that, there isn't a lot more to discuss about his childhood. Mikhail continued to achieve highly in school and graduated age 16. After school, he attended a technical college and became a qualified mechanic. During his time studying, he fell in love with a young woman and they began a relationship of sorts. When he graduated, he returned to Angarsk so as to maintain a relationship with her, but shortly after returning, he was conscripted into the military. At this point, I hit a bit of a snag with the translation. What I know for certain is that Mikhail didn't want to end the relationship, and he went about maintaining it in one of two ways. He either kept up regular contact with this woman via mail, or he sent his military pay to her via mail. I can't tell which. Either way, he was doing what he could to keep that relationship going. During his service, he was sent to Mongolia, applying his skills as a mechanic and serving his time well. His service record was clean exemplary in fact his relations with the family during the time while never excellent were consistent and had aspects of warmth to them the military also inspired a devotion to fitness within him and by the time he left he'd built himself up to be very strong extremely fit this would remain a central focus for the majority of his life and he would maintain a far above average level of fitness from then on after his two years of service were up he returned to angask and to the woman that he loved only to find that she'd fallen into the arms of another man and had a child during his absence depending on which way that translation went she either continued contact with him but never informed him of the change or she continued to accept his military payments but again told him nothing of her marriage and child either way not brilliant news for him heart is broken and i can't imagine doing anything right you have no heart either way this was a terrible betrayal to mikhail and he took the hit deeply when he confronted her she told him that she had never promised to wait for him which if you ask me kind of a dick move you could have at least given the guy a heads up rather than leading him down the garden path and or taking his money honestly you're better off without her mikhail mate she sounds like a bit of a prick yes however they weren't married or anything and i don't know <laughs> am i a little dick being really? like we how long was he at, he was it was two years they weren't married 
She is not a murderer. Definitely a dick move if she's taking the money, though. After this, Mikhail settled down in Angarsk and began looking for a job. At first, he worked in a factory as a mechanic, fixing the equipment. Then, in 1987, he made the decision to change his career and began working for the Angarsk police force in the duty unit. This mostly amounted to him taking witness statements and transporting other officers around. It was during his work in the police that he met the woman that would become his wife, who was also an employee at the station. Now, for all intents and purposes, Mikhail and Elena Popkov truly loved each other, and when she came along, they truly loved their daughter too. Their friends and neighbors recalled that they were a very happy family. There was rarely an argument to be heard between the two. However, underneath this exterior, things were not quite how they seemed. In the Popkov household, the marriage was due to take a hit in 1993. I'll let you take a guess who was causing the issues, and if you guessed it was the serial killer, well, you'd actually be wrong. He was actually an excellent husband and father. His wife, on the other hand. One day, Mikhail decided to return home for lunch with Eleanor and their daughter. But when he got there, he found his five-year-old outside their house, playing in the snow and not dressed for the cold. In Siberia, guys. <laughs> when he asked her why she was outside, she said that an uncle she'd never met before had arrived at the house and her mother had sent her outside. Uh-oh, Mikhail is like, red alert! Mikhail, of course, knew what this meant, and after picking up his daughter, he stormed into the house. What he found was his wife laid up on the couch, clearly drunk and alone. Looking around, he found a used condom in the bin. His wife tried to explain it away at first, but ended up admitting to her affair. <laughs> Good luck explaining that away. <laughs> Jesus. Which should have been the end of the marriage. Mikhail could have divorced his wife and even retained full custody of his daughter. However, he remembered what it was like to be separated from his parents. His daughter was about the age that he had been when his parents had taken him back, and he didn't want his daughter to suffer that same way. Which brings us to the more interesting thing about Mikhail Popkov. He simply does not fit the profile of a psychopathic serial killer. A psychopath would not have been capable of the level of empathy required to see this kind of perspective, much less act on it. And as far as I can tell, he has never been diagnosed with psychopathy. That's a good point. Not all serial killers are psychopaths. They often are. But it's like people who have feelings can kill for sure they're just even somehow more f-ed up but this isn't the armchair psychologist this is the casual criminalist and after he discovered his wife's infidelity Mikhail returned to drinking but even then he showed restraint rarely if ever drinking to excess he would assist his neighbors where he could and involved himself in the community in various ways he had carried his love of fitness and exercise over from the military and regularly partook in biathlon events doing cycling and running his first kill was actually entirely accidental to hear him tell it he was terrified the first time he thought people would be looking for him when the body was discovered he was one of the first to respond and it was not uncommon for him to return to his crime scenes as the responding officer this gave him a distinct advantage over most serial killers if you can even call it that he would alter witness testimony ignore protocol leave or even hide evidence he would also have easy access to the evidence locker and remove weapons that had already been impounded by the police in any competent police force this would have given a very strong link to the weapon let's not forget this isn't just any police force this is the angarsk police force the same place that will accept a pinky promise as verification for an alibi also they just completely ignore bodies showing up on the same road being like it's just unrelated this road's just really unlucky this dirt bar is just a coincidence this is where all the charred bodies of young women show up and the reason like he's a serial killer he's on the inside and he's like guys it's a joke why wouldn't i serial kill no one's gonna catch me have you seen us Wish it. This is absurd. And what about motive? I mean, most killers have something resembling a motive, even if it's irrational and emotion based. If you recall at the opening, I quoted a police officer. What did she expect going out like that? She was asking for trouble. Well, that was my sneaky little way of telling you Popkov's stated motive. He wanted to rid the streets of what he called immoral women. In other words, these were women that would be willing to get into a man's car and have sex with him. According to officials, his discovery of his wife's affair was the catalyzing event that caused his murder spree to begin. Yeah, I'm not like given his background and stuff. You can imagine it'd be something like that because his like head is all twisted around from his parents and from his wife and all of this stuff. I, I'm not surprised that that's his motivation, however weird it is. 
The year following the intervention of the specialist investigators, Popkov began cutting down on his kill rate. Police checkpoints had been set up around the city, and they were given orders to look out for a male transporting an inebriated female passenger. Of course, Popkov was a police officer and knew where all of these were. It's brilliant work. And they know at this point, they've had evidence that it could be a police officer from two separate things. The police tire track at one of the crime scenes and the woman who says she was picked up by a police officer who was literally this dude so what the f on the nights that he killed using his own car he would just avoid them and on the nights that he was using a police car he'd just drive straight through perhaps out of fear or because he just wanted to change a pace popkov decided to quit the police force shortly before 1998 and ended up working as a consultant to a security firm i don't think that's smart like if you're serial killing you've got a massive advantage as we've already discussed he can remove evidence he can like break the rules he can adjust the testimony to get himself out of trouble if you're not in the police you're not gonna be able to do that this gave him fewer opportunities to spend the night patrolling around town it also meant that he no longer had access to the evidence locker meaning he no longer had access to untraceable weapons and any evidence that he left behind as such we see a lull in killings he seemed to have taken the cautious route and only killed when it was safe to do so but as he saw it there was only one thing that would bring an end to his crusade against women and that was getting caught the final documented killing that i could find was of two women marina lysina and her friend known only as pashkovskaya the two women worked together in a supermarket one being a supervisor and the other being a checkout assistant one night after work the two friends decided to go out drinking several hours later they were leaving their chosen drinking establishment and weren't seen again for three days that night her husband had returned home from work to find her missing he knew she would sometimes go out drinking but she would usually be back before him to look after the children it shows just how little faith the citizens of angarsk had for their police force that he didn't even bother reporting her disappearance instead electing to search for himself along with his brother that's depressing when someone disappears like that and you're like yeah the police are going to be useless that's so intense when the bodies were found it was clear that they'd fallen prey to the angarsk maniac however there were a couple of breaks from his usual mo first was that he hadn't had sex with them second was that one of them had been killed in the early hours of the morning but her friend had been killed roughly six hours later with a different weapon the police were baffled and thought that the only reasonable explanation was that the killer had a house near the murder site and had imprisoned one of them this was not the case and the real cause was actually far more banal i'll give some in a second to speculate on why one had died hours after the other gosh okay on the spot with a bit of thinking there either they were picked up like they went out together maybe they became separated and happened to be picked up at different times or he killed the first one then locked the other one up in the boot of the car or something like that or I don't know there's lots of potential options so when the two friends left the bar they searched for a taxi to get home but had no luck so they began flagging down passing cars and well guess who the next person to cross their path was pulling over to the side of the road they climbed into the back seat of popkov's black honda civic and the usual questions followed where are you going home where have you been partying are you married yes why are you with your husbands they're working would you like to keep the party going sure the conversation told popkov everything he needed to know these were fallen women and so they needed to die popkov drove out to a small campsite where he often brought his family and began plying the women with alcohol it was clear that both of them were interested in playing on this popkov pulled one of them aside acting like he was choosing which one to have sex with once he had chosen one he pulled her out of the car and they went into the dark forest once out of sight of her friend popkov strangled his victim until he was satisfied that she wouldn't get up once done he returned to the car and told the friends that they had found a good spot and that she should come join them she obliged and began walking in the direction of her friends with popkov following behind her before she could even spot her friend lying on the ground popkov swung a hatchet into the back of her head she fell to the ground and popkov continued attacking until she stopped moving satisfied with his work he disposed of the evidence and departed by the time he got home the sun was near to rising and he was just about to get ready for bed when he realized that his police badge was missing that is a moment of panic then he's like oh f also have we explained why one of them died later i'm assuming because he didn't kill one of them successfully and 
she died of exposure hours later or just died somehow later he searched his car but of course it wasn't there then he suddenly remembered that one of the women had asked if she could see it while they were drinking in the back of the car he immediately jumped in his car and made his way back to the campsite upon arrival he found more than just his badge his first victim that he had strangled seemingly to death was now up and staggering around the campsite popkov got out of his car pulled a shovel from his boot and finished the job it's sad to think that if he had only remembered the badge 15 minutes later she might have had enough time to regain her senses and find her way to the main road which was only five or six hundred meters from the campsite i don't know how you expected me to guess this angus you're like let's i would speculate it's like <laughs> i would never be able to get this as far as i could tell this is the last publicly confirmed murder that i could find it's safe to assume that there were indeed murder victims that followed this but i couldn't find any hard evidence of them i've seen claims that his murder spree continued for another two years with one claiming that it was for another 12 years but most sources agree that the year 2000 was his final year as it turns out it wasn't even the police that brought an end to the raping and murdering it was syphilis yes that's right old mikhail popkov made a small mistake in his crusade to eradicate the quote-unquote immoral women of angarsk he hadn't considered the fact that people willing to engage in unprotected sex with strangers are also the same people who were more likely to carry an std and if i had you going there for a moment don't worry he didn't die he just couldn't get it up anymore so he lost his motivation to kill or something like that this may be the one time in history that syphilis actually saved lives papers often say that it was syphilis induced impotence that stopped him from killing but seeing as we know he was happy to kill without having sex and that syphilis was perfectly treatable with antibiotics i don't think that this was his reason for stopping i think it had more to do with the increased police detention and the fact that he was no longer a police officer whatever the reason for his cessation it must have been a bit of a shock to the investigators when 2001 came and went without a single popkov style death months went by and no new bodies turned up the investigation slowed and the officers turned to different things likely very pleased that the embarrassing saga was over the only ones that continued working on the case were those specifically assigned to it they were told to keep working and thinking of new ways to find him but to no avail it wasn't until january 2002 when the investigation got a shot of adrenaline okay well it seems like there's more than one thing working on it syphilis made him less uh it made him impotent and had a lower sex drive and also he wasn't a police officer anymore so it just sounds like he's got less reasons to kill people not that his reasons were reasons at all the task force that month an article written by journalist mark deutsch and published in an online publication called the moscow cosm cos coms comsomalat the moscow comsomalat don't ask me what that means i genuinely can't find a translation that doesn't insist this newspaper isn't a type of soviet submarine anyway this article was titled the wednesday killer owing to most of the bodies coincidentally being found on wednesdays this journalist mark deutsch was not one pulling punches it seems and in this article he made it very clear just how badly the authorities had botched the murder investigation <laughs> what murder investigation the authorities are a joke I have to say that's a ballsy move considering russia's history without spoken journalists but it did seem to work yeah even now it's like every other day on the bbc it's like another russian oligarch has fallen off his balcony fallen down the stairs been involved in a car accident and it's like oh clumsy oligarchs <laughs> so so clumsy and you'd same with journalists and stuff in the past and probably presence it's pretty shocking it lit a fire under the arse of the investigators and a task force was assembled pulling some of the best criminal investigators from around russia also if you're wondering mark deutsch is dead he died in 2012 by drowning outside his villa i'll let you decide if that's suspicious no he's just clumsy he just drives clumsy journalists and oligarchs in russia super clumsy always falling in their pool pools always falling down the stairs and off their balconies and onto knives unlike his first attempt this wasn't just some outside consultory assistance now there were 12 or 13 people solely focused on finding him however building a case on just a few bits of useful evidence wasn't really a viable option to hear the investigators put it quote we weren't even starting from zero we were starting from less than zero all right okay well that's a good start it's a good start if we were to put this in western terms the new task force was like the fbi rolling in on the local police force owing to the embarrassing way the case had been handled thus far all but 
a few of the Angarsk police force were willing to actually assist the new task force investigators, preparing to wash their hands of the case and move on. With close to nothing to go on, the task force were at a bit of a loss for how to proceed. In the end, their chosen method was to slowly and painstakingly comb through every possible avenue of investigation that had even the remotest possibility of turning up results. Because the initial investigations had been handled so poorly, any direct evidence had to be discounted immediately. The only bits of evidence that weren't completely useless to them were the three DNA samples that linked three of the murders, one sample of car tire tracks and several sets of fingerprints. There was also one bit of evidence that the police couldn't completely ruin, and that was witness and archival information. So, fast forward to 2008, and the investigation had made some headway. After looking over hundreds of murder cases in the area, the investigators had managed to link 22 murders to Popkov. Furthermore, their boosted funding and improvements in DNA analysis technology had provided them with a complete genotype of the killer. They also knew that his blood type was B, that he had at one point driven a car called a Neva, and that he had previously or was still working for the Angarsk police. Surely, surely, we are moments away from his well overdue capture with all of this evidence and effort and all of this stuff that's completely turned this around like russian fbi are on their sh let's go for popkov the only thing that had changed during the intervening years was his job at some point in the previous six years he'd quit his position in the security company and was now driving long distances transporting cars between the port city of vladivostok in the far east and Angarsk. by the time 2009 rolled around the investigators had managed to compile a list of 3500 possible suspects and way down that list in the p section was the name mikhail popkov 3500 suspects didn't they say they knew his how many surely B-type blood, driving a Neva at some point in their lives, and a police officer in the Angarsk police, police is not that many people, surely. Though he didn't have to worry, it wasn't until three years later that they finally made it his name on the list. It was March of 2012, Popkov was summoned as a witness. I haven't found any comments on how his interrogation went, but I'd like to imagine there was a pool of sweat underneath his seat by the time the interview concluded. Just before he left, the officers asked Popkov if he would give a sample of his DNA. The stated reason was for vaccine tests on previous military conscripts. This was pretty solid reasoning, as most men of around his age were previous military conscripts. They sent the DNA off to the lab and continued their investigation. It wasn't until two months later, in early June, that the results came back. Mikhail Popkov was a 100% match. Game f***ing over, you piece of sh Arrest By now, Popkov knew that the jig was up. As a police officer, he was aware that if he had been called in for questioning on his own case and then had a DNA sample taken, the chances that he wouldn't get caught were ready slim to none. As such, the way he responded to the knowledge that he was about to lose his freedom typifies the unusual case that is Mikhail Popkov. When Ted Bundy escaped from prison, he chose to simply hide his identity and try to get as many murders under his belt as possible before he could get caught again. When John Wayne Gacy was being tailed by the police, he resorted to drink driving, threatening his investigators, and finally having a nervous breakdown in his lawyer's office. When Mikhail Popkov realized that his time was limited, he took some time off work and went camping with his family. After that, he took a train to Moscow and spent some time with his sister and her family. After that, he visited his mother, visited his father's grave, and then he returned home. Popkov chose to spend the time saying goodbye. He truly is a strange case in the world of serial killers. However, I wouldn't have brought you on this long journey, provided all of that detail, only for its end with him getting arrested, sitting on his couch. Oh no, dear viewer and or listener, that wouldn't do. And it wouldn't do for Mikhail Popkov either. So, if you'd be so kind, allow me to give you the facts, but also just add a splash of dramatization. The month is June. It's been about six weeks since his interview, and Popkov knows his time is nearly up. He said his goodbyes, he has made his peace with what's about to happen. Now all there is left to do is to wait. As he sits there in his apartment waiting, he considers the things he would have done differently. He thinks about whether he regrets what he has done, the actions that have brought him to this point. What do you have to lose at this point by just going on the run? Just making a go of it? Just be like, F let's go. Pack some bags and just see if you can start a new life somewhere else. Like, get out of Russia, get as far away as you can, and just start a new murdery life. What are you talking about, man? Not that I want that for you. I want you to be hung. Let's go. Was it the right thing to do? Was he mistaken in his hatred? <laughs> no, and yes. He thinks about how people will look at him from now on. Uh, he will be compared to the likes of Chikolito and Vasily Komrov. 
He also knows just how many people he has killed. He knows that there are more bodies to his name than any other criminal in modern Russian history. Then he starts to formulate a plan. Perhaps now is not the time to give up. If he was going to go down in infamy, he may as well be the most infamous of them all. He jumps up and he begins packing a bag. Okay, there we go. <laughs> They may as, well, may as well make a run for it. The following day, there's a knock on the door. Time's up. The police are here. Several moments pass, but they receive no reply, so they knock again, calling his name again. No reply. An investigator steps aside, and an officer with a batter in ram steps forward. On the count of three, he gives an almighty swing, and the door bursts wide open. Cautiously, they step inside, checking every corner, making sure he isn't hiding somewhere, waiting to attack. First, they clear the living room, then the kitchen, then the bedroom, and then the bathroom, but they find nothing. The apartment is deserted. The investigator is about to put out a call on the radio when he notices the gun cabinet in the living room. The doors are open. The guns are missing. Immediately, they start making inquiries, giving orders for all officers to be on the lookout, and descriptions of pop carver sent out across the city. Meanwhile, the investigation starts searching his computer. His wife has been told of his arrest and that he is missing, and she gives them the password for his computer. It only takes a moment to find out where he's gone. The previous day, he purchased a train ticket that took him from Angarsk to Vladivostok. They feared that his plan was to carry out a mass shooting when he made it to the port city. The journey from Angarsk takes three days on the train, and Popkov already had a day and a half a head start on them. And according to his wife, he was equipped with a semi-automatic hunting rifle and several hundred rounds of ammo. Stopping the train wasn't an option, as Popkov would be expecting this, and as if they raised any suspicion, they risked him beginning his spree on the train. They needed to do it in such a way that they caught him by surprise. The head investigator contacted the prosecution office in Moscow and told them the situation. This put them in contact with the Air Force general, who was able to divert a military transport jet to the Angarsk airport. They got on board and flew out of an airport near Usaresk and waited. They were going to catch Popkov's train just before he made it to Vladivostok. Twelve hours after they arrived, Popkov's train pulled into the station. Four officers in plain clothes boarded the train, two on either side. They waited for the train to pull off, as he would have been expecting an arrest in the station, and so likely would have a gun close at hand. They waited for ten minutes after the train had pulled away, and then they executed their plan. At the same time, both officers began closing in from either side of the train. This way, he would have no escape route. They knew which seat he was in, but they didn't know if he had moved, and fortunately he hadn't. They entered his train car, spotting him sitting right in the middle, facing forwards. They began moving at the same time, and as they closed the distance, they noticed a gun bag seated between his legs. When they made it to his seat, he looks up. Mikhail Popkov? They ask. Yes? You're under arrest on suspicion of murder. Popkov casts his eyes down, but he doesn't move. After a moment, he nods and says, All right. I understand. Then he gets up and allows himself to be handcuffed. We are two thirds of the way through, and I really feel like this is the end of the story. So I get the feeling we're diving deep into, especially as the next section is titled How Many, we're going to dive deep into the true horrors of this. How many? And just like that, after nearly 20 years at large, they finally had him. The maniac of Angarsk was indeed. Just a man. Upon his arrival at the Angas jail, he denied all charges and tried to give it the old charm, but investigators were having none of it. When it became clear that they had some pretty damning evidence, he switched up his tactic and began prevaricating, neither denying or admitting his guilt. Now, there aren't any official records that I can find about what happened next, but it seems that his investigators gave him an ultimatum to quote, I told him that we could either do this the easy way or we could do this the hard way. No, that wasn't a quote from an old cop movie. This was one of the head investigators for Popkov's case. They don't elaborate on what precisely the hard way might be, and I don't really know. Russia doesn't have the death penalty, so he can't have been threatening that, and seeing as I got that quote from a public interview, I doubt he was admitting to threatening to beat a confession out of one of his prisoners. Apparently, Popkov understood what this meant, though, and he chose the easy way, cooperating from then on. I must break you. I think the easy way or the hard way could be like, look, the hard way is we have this absolutely massive pile of evidence which is absolutely irrefutable and is going to make you go down. The easy way is you just telling us you did it because, dude, we know. We know. You know. We know. You're going down. Do you want to just admit it? That's the easy way. Overall, it doesn't seem like he had too bad of a time at the hands of his old comrades in the Angarsk police station. Perhaps they were making an effort to look after their old friends, or perhaps they were just trying to keep him sweet so as to get a bunch of confessions out of him. Either way, he had a lot of privileges that were allowed to him. Order food, get cigarettes, drink, see family, watch TV, and 
receive various parcels. All the while, he was confessing to a plethora of crimes. As of his arrest, the earliest kill they had linked to Popkov was in 1994. By the time his first hearing was to occur, thanks to confessions, they pushed it to 1993 and the first burn body to turn up. They also believed that his body count sat at around 22, give or take. In the course of three years in police custody, Popkov was able to recall all of them and provide extra details that only the killer would know. He also explained to them how he was able to commit a murder so effectively without capture. To start with, he could avoid witnesses because he would avoid suspicion. He wouldn't go looking to kill his victims. He would let them come to him. As an officer, he would patrol the street, seek out women who were alone. He would ask them if they needed a lift. If they said no, he would move on, no suspicion raised. If they said yes, he would allow them into the car. On the way, he would talk to them, ask why they were out, and why they were unescorted. I feel like he's trying to be this, like some big brain killer, like, this is how I got away with it, guys. You're not going to believe how smart I am. Whereas the reality is, it's like you didn't get caught because the police were shit. They were so shit. And when they brought in the big boy police, you got busted almost immediately. I mean, as fast as the technology allowed. So you're not that clever. You're not that good. The police were just shit. You just happened to be doing serial killing in a place where the, the, the enforcement was rubbish. They would tell him all he needed to know, and based on this information, he would decide if they should die. If he thought they were a good person, he would simply take them to their destination and move on. If they were drunk, and he decided they were immoral or unfaithful, he would ask if they wanted to continue drinking with him, which they almost always did. He would drive them out to the woods and have sex with them. At some point during the encounter, he would choke the victim until she fell unconscious, which would leave no trace of blood in the car. He would then drag the body out of the vehicle and use a weapon, lifted from the evidence locker in the police station, to kill the woman. If he used a blunt weapon, he would aim for the head and position himself away from the wounds, preventing blood splatter on his uniform. If he used a sharp weapon, he would stab in the face, the head, the shoulders. He was careful to never cut arteries, which would cause blood splatter. Then he would position the body, often to make it appear as though the woman had been killed during sex, and leave them there. After that, he would drive three to five kilometers away and bury any evidence. This would include bags, weapons, used alcohol bottles. This wasn't a half-assed attempt at hiding the evidence either. He would bury them up to six feet deep. The distance and depth guaranteed that the evidence would never be found, and indeed not one piece of evidence that he intentionally hid was ever found by the police. Well, okay, apparently just bury your evidence really deep and no one will ever find it. I thought I, I didn't realize that that was good enough. I thought they'd have like ground penetrating radar and stuff to look down and find your your cr criminal accessories. In 2015, after three years of interrogation, Popkov was convicted of 22 counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. He was also convicted of rape, though it doesn't say how many counts. For these offenses, he was given a life sentence to be served in a special regime colony, which as far as I could tell is pretty much a modern gulag, and no, I am not joking. The day following his sentence, his lawyer appealed the decision on the grounds there was insufficient evidence of rape, with Popkov insisting that any woman he had sex with was done consensually. He also said his sentence should be lighter based upon the fact that he actively cooperated with the investigators following his arrest. How much lighter do you want? You're never getting out of prison. You murdered 22 people. It's like, okay, okay, look, 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 we'll cut it a bit easy. We'll just give you 18 life sentences. You know, because you cooperated. Where do you think this is going? Finally, they argued that a few of his earliest murders should be ignored as they exceeded the statute of limitations for murder. I'm surprised there is a statute of limitations for murder. That seems a bit silly. The appeal was taken to the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation, but ultimately the ruling was upheld, and so Popkov was carted off to a modern gulag to spend the rest of his days doing compulsory work, which is probably just another word for hard labor minus the communism. Or so everybody thought. See, Popkov didn't really feel like going to the gulag. He'd grown rather accustomed to the cushy conditions of the regional jail in Irkutsk, so he decided to let the police in on a little secret. They hadn't found all of his murder victims. In fact, they hadn't even found half of them. So the authorities pulled him out of his colony and returned him to his home city to talk to the authorities. There, he received his usual helpings of interrogation incentives. At first it was 10 new bodies, then it was 20, then it was 30 and 40. As the years went on, the body count seemed to endlessly rise. He would recall his locations of murders, locations of evidence of murder weapons, and on at least two occasions, bodies that the police hadn't even found. Remember that eidetic memory of Popkov's? Well, he was making full use of it now. It seemed as though he had a list of every cold case, murder victim, and missing persons case in the entire area of Angarsk. When asked if he could recall names, dates, locations, conversations, the clothing the victim was wearing, the weather on the night, even the alcohol they were drinking, he could deliver. By the time the dust settled, Popkov's total murder count had risen to 81 murders and two attempted murders, of which he was convicted of and given a second life sentence 
in 2018. More recently, he has been pulled out of a special colony again to give testimony of two more murders that he had remembered, and indeed, more evidence was found to corroborate this. With so many convictions to his name, Popkov is one of the most prolific serial killers of all time, and the most prolific serial killer in modern Russian history, even beating out the infamous Andrei Chikatila. Of course, the maniac of Angarsk was nowhere near as bloodthirsty or as outright gruesome as the Rostov Ripper, but in terms of body count, he almost doubles his communist counterpart. I think the Rostov Ripper was the, the one I was talking about previously in the west of Russia, around maybe Moscow or somewhere, and also wasn't caught forever because of police incompetence. Come on, Russia, get it together. The Conspiracy Theory As today's episode draws to a close, I'd just like to explore one last avenue of thought. First and foremost, I'm not the conspiracy theory type. I feel that the most obvious answer is also the most likely answer. I'm not saying that conspiracy theories can't or don't happen, but I am saying that most conspiracies rely on mistrust more than they rely on evidence. Totally agree with that entire statement there. Um, yeah, conspiracy theories, sometimes, very rarely, they turn out to be true, which is crazy, but most of the time, they're not. And the wilder the conspiracy theory, the less likely. That being said, about halfway through the script, I began to harbor a sneaking suspicion. As I continued to research and write, this suspicion grew, and as of completing it, I've come to the unassailable conclusion that something really fucky is going on with this case. And as such, I've decided to leave it up to you, dear listener and or viewer, to tell me if you agree. As I said, I'm not a conspiracy. Is this going to have something to do with the police, like the corruption and stuff, like whether there's a cover up and someone knew what was going on and something like that, or more people from the police were involved somehow? As I said, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I prefer to present this as I might a case in court, the court of a public opinion, if you will. In line with that, we have to start with the rule that a lack of evidence does not constitute guilt. Across my research, I found a distinct lack of any primary sources, no police death certificates, no witness statements. Now, this is partly down to my own limitations as a researcher. I'll say one last time, my Russian is a long way from perfect, and so I won't be able to search the internet for source material as effectively as I would for an English case. But even when you consider this, there was only one primary source document that I could find across the entire story, and that was a verification that the letter sent in 1998 was indeed a real thing. With that said, I'd like to accuse the Angarsk police force of facilitating the crimes of Mikhail Popkov. I believe not only did they know that he was committing murder on a regular basis, but they facilitated it. Holy sh**. Allegedly much. <laughs> My first piece of evidence. How in the name of all things good and holy can one police force be that bloody inept? Eight years and no one suspected a thing? I mean, there's a big difference between facilitating and just being sh** your job or being purposefully facilitating is helping then there are two other options they knew about it and just did nothing about it or they didn't know about it because they were fully incompetent to jump to facilitating does feel like a bit of a bit of a jump to be honest friend once met some russians and they ate him Eight years of this man going into the evidence lock and removing weapons and no one saw him. Eight whole years where not one officer even suspected that there was a mass murder in the city, much less one of their colleagues. Only three viable DNA samples were taken from a total of 81 murder scenes. I just find it hard to believe that no one, not a single person, even suspected the presence of a serial killer in the city. However, none of that is convincing beyond all reasonable doubt, so I'm going to give you some hard facts. I don't know what I missed, but <laughs> this is getting good, boys. First, during an interview, a lead investigator explained explains that the discovery of his wife's infidelity caused Popkov to go on a murder spree. The only problem with that is Popkov's first murder was in 1992, a full year prior to his discovering his wife's infidelity. The investigator would have known this discrepancy, so why would he lie? Second, the Angarsk police did not publicly admit that there was a serial killer until instructed to do so. My point being that an outside organization was able to correctly conclude that there was a serial killer in Angarsk based only on the information contained within a single letter written by a prosecutor. If they could correctly conclude that from a single letter, why was the police force not able to do the same, considering they had access to all and more relevant information that was not contained within the letter? Again. I don't think we should underestimate how grossly incompetent people can be. And also, there's a big difference between facilitating 
once again between facilitating and just ignoring third a detective in the angas police force showed popkov a map of the police's weak spots in the angas area this was a map literally pointing out the areas where the police was weakest or if you were to look at it from the perspective of a serial killer a map of the places you could commit a murder and be least likely to be spotted this event was not only proven but also corroborated by the angask police themselves not only that but the police officer in question would later be the head of popkov's investigation he was one of the few members of the angas police that joined the task force and he became the lead investigator remember that when popkov was caught it was based on the connection to three bits of dna evidence found on his victims once popkov was captured this same investigator tried to stop the task force pursuing any more murder charges even though it was clear he had committed more that is mad suspicious dude two weeks later this lead investigator was dismissed from the case not only that he was stripped of his career and removed outright from the police force I tried to find a way to contact him but could only find articles discussing his dismissal it's also worth mentioning that the reason for his dismissal was not due to impeding popkov's conviction but for a different reason altogether that's mighty big coincidence there fourth a different member of the angas police force had gone on live tv to publicly state that there was a conspiracy surrounding the arrest of popkov his last appearance was in 2017 and he stated that popkov had worked with at least one accomplice i went searching for him and i found that he died earlier this year age 47 i couldn't find his cause of death they killed him they give anybody a heart attack maybe it was clumsiness five popkov just stopped killing after he left angask he spent many many hours driving back and forth from vladivostok after he quit the police force so surely if he was killing of his own volition he would have struggled to resist the urge to kill seeing as the opportunity to pick up a hitchhiker would have presented itself many times and it would have been very hard to prove it was him six this one is probably the least necessary to outright state but they literally had two witnesses who had spoken to the killer appeared with similar injuries found in the same place and given similar testimony independently of each other yeah this is where it got absurd in their incompetence like that the police tracks the dna the the, the woman being picked up by him and describing him and nothing being done does it i can see why we lean towards the conspiracy angle here because that was wild back when it ex was explained earlier in today's episode and it's even more wild considering all this extra stuff now even if their testimony was legitimately ruled as unreliable after two of them turned up stating the same thing i'd have at least kept an eye on popkov just checked in on him every now and again perhaps make a quick check of the evidence locker after he went in apparently this didn't cross the mind of a single person in the police station seven and the last one i promise an employee of the Angarsk Police Department literally saw Popkov rooting through the handbag of one of his victims in the evidence locker. I'll ask one more time, how did no one suspect him? I could keep going, but my main argument boils down to this. With so many coincidental and even downright suspicious happenings around the case, I find it difficult to believe that there was not at least some intentional incompetence by the Angarsk police. My theory suggests that the Angarsk police force knowingly turned a blind eye to Popkov, killing the women of Angarsk. Let's not forget that a large portion of the people he killed were sex workers. Perhaps they saw this as a problem and they wished to permit Popkov to solve this problem for them. Really? The sex workers are the problem? I don't i don't understand like really it's a giant city there's going to be sex work it is what it is and they weren't always sex workers some of them were just young women who wanted to go out and party i i it, it seems like a bit of a stretch that that there was a larger group than one deranged man who wanted them to be killed that's a bit of a stretch in my opinion then when the irkutsk prosecutor wrote that letter to the ministry of internal affairs the police did the minimum amount of investigating they could while not arousing suspicion but really they just tried to brush it under the rug popkov was told to quit as to keep his distance from the investigation then when the 2002 article came out and the ministry of internal affairs took matters into their own hands the police force set about creating an image of such disorganization that it would impede the investigation and give an alibi as to why they had no leads when popkov was caught he was told ahead of time which was why he was able to time leaving his apartment so perfectly i mean think about it mass shootings don't fit his mo he had no problem with normal everyday people just women that would cheat on their husbands so why go and shoot up a random city plus he had a full month and a half between his dna sample and his arrest if he had left even a day before he would have made it to vladivostok in time to complete his mission but he chose the exact right moment to leave the theory doesn't explain why he would choose to do this but it does seem rather suspicious yeah and the problem here is 
you pointed out a lot of things that are suspicious but they're really lacking motivation like i don't know what his motivation is for that i don't think the police wanting to eliminate sex workers is enough of a motivation all of this is like conspiracies it's like yeah maybe but why and this is really lacking the why which is why i think it does fall into conspiracy theory and i have to say look i've done the research that angus has done but I kind of feel this sliding more into gross negligence, to be honest. I'd like to state again that I have limited access to information. It may be possible that the answers to my suspicions are out there and I haven't been able to find them. But I am skeptical that I would miss such large amounts of very specific information. For example, the only missing person reports that I could find were reports of individuals that had close family members. But remember that sex workers made up the majority of PopCop's victims and yet there was not one mention of them by police. In part, this will be because they perhaps didn't have families to do the filing of reports and make the information public, but this wasn't always the case. Yeah, it's probably not going to be the case. They're young. It's not going to be the case in the majority of cases. Remember Popkov's final murder, the one where he forgot his badge? The families of the two victims didn't file those reports because they didn't trust the police. The police were the ones to do that when the bodies were found. So we know that on at least one occasion, the police made the information about a disappearance public without the input of a family. But still, the only reports we have are of those victims who were not sex workers. However, as conspicuous as all that might be, I'll say again that a lack of evidence doesn't actually denote guilt, nor does it exonerate. And with that, I rest my case. I don't know if that was convincing to you, but there are at least some very suspicious happenings around the whole affair. Unfortunately, I doubt that those suspicions will ever be laid to rest. Yeah, I have to say, I do think it's a conspiracy theory. I don't think there's enough evidence to be sure. As I said, I lean more to the they're just wildly incompetent or just don't care rather than complicity. Wrap up. And there you have it. The story and the conspiracy of Mikhail Popkov. This is one of the strangest scripts I think I've ever researched. I say that for many reasons, but for one thing, Popkov just didn't seem like the serial killing type. I've been able to track down a first-hand account of his psychological examination, but every mention of his assessment that I can find gives no mention of psychopathy. The only diagnosis that has been bestowed upon Popkov regarding his propensity for murder was a diagnosis of homicide mania. I've never heard of homicide mania. I've never heard of this as an actual psychological diagnosis. I mean, I've heard of people being called homicidal maniacs before, but I've never heard it used as an actual psychological diagnosis. In essence, it's just a desire to kill, nothing more, nothing less. Usually when you catch a serial killer, they have a wide swath of psychological red flags, and narcissism, delusions of grandeur, low self-esteem, psychopathy, sociopathy, all of that stuff. Popkov had none of that, though. He just had a desire to kill. And when you think about it and consider his actions, he has given several notable examples of empathy across his life. Now, allow me to draw your attention back to the treatment of his family, the empathy he showed towards his daughter, the fact that he chose to go see his family during his final moments of freedom. Of course, he also did kill people, so, you know, there's that. But my point is that he seemed to have a lot of empathy for the ones he loved, even if it was only for them. Yeah, like I said earlier, serial killers don't need to be psychopaths. Not every psychopath is a serial killer. Not every serial killer is a psychopath. Whether you believe the conspiracy or not, though, there's no getting around the fact that Popkov was a cold-blooded killer who used a flimsy excuse to justify snuffing out the lives of scores of women. Thanks to his actions, many children had to grow up without a mother. Many parents had to go to a morgue and identify their own daughters and countless other unnamed but no less innocent women had their chance at life taken away from them by this one man and his fatuous crusade. He didn't really want to make a change. He didn't want to cleanse the streets of so-called immoral women. If he truly wanted to make a difference in his city, he would have done his job as a police officer. He would have actually listened to the responses that his victims gave and helped them. He would have checked in and made sure they were safe. He would have tried to make sure that their kids were cared for. He would have been a member of the community. But instead, he chose to kill those women, and in doing so, he destroyed families and destabilized the lives of many children. Natasha Gorolina, the girl who opened the scripts with, recalls her mother's funeral. She spoke about seeing her mother lying in a casket. Even through the thick makeup, you could see the purple bruising around the areas where Popkov had furiously broken her skull open. Natasha was five when her mother died. That means she was the same age as Popkov when he returned home and found that his parents had replaced him with a daughter. So I guess it's true what they say. Trauma and neglect really do exist in a cycle. Dismembered Appendices 
Number one, I can't in good conscience submit this script without making this disclaimer first. There are several parts of this story that are fabricated by me. There were no major alterations made to the course of events and were all minor points or facts about the case. I did it primarily when there was missing or conflicting information and used it as a means of maintaining continuity in the flow of the story. If you're interested in what parts these are, I will write them in a list and they can be put in the description. Sorry, podcast listeners. Simon, you can admit this if you don't want it. Just let me know. I thought I'd say it. Um, okay, I've read it already, so we'll have it in there. Um, oh, these are really minor things. Just stuff about specific murder weapons. Yeah, they'll be in the comments on the YouTube video. So, yeah, but they, it didn't change the like <laughs> the actual story. Number two. During my research, I became quite well acquainted with Russian media, and it was most certainly an illuminating experience. One thing I learned is that Russian journalists are just as bad for checking their information as they are in the UK. Another is that Russian authorities love to talk to the press but hate to produce any paperwork that will be used as primary source material. Strangest of all was my discovery of Russian style talk shows. My favorite show was literally called Let Them Talk and can only be described as a bizarre mashup of the Jeremy Carl show, that's Jerry Springer to Americans, and the Oprah show, in which guests are first interviewed by a shit-stirring host and then get openly roasted by members of the audience. In the episode I watched, Popkov's wife was invited on the show, where she was interviewed by the host, insisting that she knew nothing of her husband's activities and then proceeded to get into a shouting match with an elderly member of the audience. Holy shit. Number three. Continuing on the theme of strangeness, this is by far one of the strangest cases I've ever come across. I remember the lead investigator that was suspended and then removed from the case in the weeks following Popkov's arrest? Well, the alleged reason for this was that he had started up a relationship with Popkov's wife and then moved into Popkov's apartment only two weeks after his arrest. Considering what we already know about him showing Popkov that map and also impeding the investigators from pinning more than three murders on him, this was a particularly strange twist. But it did make for a very funny interview. During the interview, the replacement to the lead investigator was being questioned about his predecessor, and I'll just give you the quote of the interview. Journalist, in reference to showing Popkov the map. It's fair to say uh, there was some kind of friendship between these two men. Investigator. Friendship? What do you mean by friendship? He slept with a man's wife, and then he proceeds to chuckle. Oh, gosh. Number four, Russia has their own version of Skillshare. It's called Skill Factory. There isn't much more on this one. I just thought it was neat. <laughs> okay, how do you discover this? Number five, there was a TV show about Popkov that was released in 2020 called The Good Man. It's said to have a star-studded cast and a very accomplished Russian director attached to it. I was almost tempted to watch it, but it's not on Netflix, and Googling Russian Netflix gave me no results. By the way, have I told you about our new sponsor? Webflix is an online stream platform just like normal Netflix, only a bit more Russian. <laughs> Oh god, I can't accept that Russian money now. Number six. Remember the journalist who wrote the article in 2002? Well, I had to look into his other work, and in between some very normal sounding articles were some of the most colorful article titles I've ever seen. Notable examples include Unintended Joy, Erotic Show, Daddy's Pranks, Gay Slaves, Return to the Womb, and Who Could Forget Such Classics as Communists Like It Hot. Wow. <laughs> if you're curious as I was, I have good news. I took time to read the Gay Slave article. It's an expose piece decrying the Russian invasion of Chechnya and informing on a genocide committed by Russian forces upon Chechen refugees in 1999. 170,000 people were killed in Russian carbon bombing attacks. I have the foggiest idea where gay slaves come into it. And also, so uh, that was the guy who drowned in his pool at the age of 47? Um, ah, yeah, it's clumsy. Definitely clumsy. And on that clumsy note, that's where we're going to end today's episode. Uh, <laughs> if I ever have an accident. Look, clumsy. Whistler, so clumsy. Uh, that's where we're going to end today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you enjoy this show, please do leave it a review. If you're listening to it as a podcast, if you're enjoying it on YouTube, a like, a subscribe is very much appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Just a reminder at the end of today's video that it was brought to you by Enlisted. You can play Enlisted for free on PC, Xbox Series X and S, as well as PS5. Just go to enlisted.link forward slash enlisted casual criminalist. Follow the link below to download the game and get your exclusive bonus now. And I'll see you in the next video.